Number 10, apple bobbing. Okay folks, time to paint a picture for you. I love doing this. It's a warm summer night. You're at the county fair. You've managed to eat enough fried food to feed a large family. And even more surprisingly, you fit into those blue jeans. They're tight. The sound of carnival games and people having fun pollutes the background. That's when you see her. She's tall, blonde, and is wearing a pair of cowboy boots. Yeehaw. She calls you over. There's an apple bobbing game. You've never bobbed for apples before, but to impress the pretty lady in cowboy boots, you go for it anyway. You fail, and now you're cold, wet, and ladyless. Yes, this fine American carnival game gets its roots from the Middle Ages. It's simple, fun, and no matter what time period you live in, sometimes it was even used as a form of dating, which is kind of weird, actually. Names were written on the apples, kind of like speed dating, and then you'd bob for them, and then you'd go off of whoever's name was on the apple. I I've done it before. I'm not very good at apple bobbing. And now I'm just cold, wet, and maidenless. Number nine, Kitty Bonfire. This is the worst. Yeah, I've talked a lot about a lot of naughty stuff in my time here as the king of the hive, but this one, it just sucks, dude. Look, we've all been bored before. I have too. Have we all done stupid things when we're bored? Yes. Remember Roman candles? You point them at each other, you shoot the fireworks at each other. Some of you done it. Don't lie to me. I know you did. Sure, that's just a part of growing up though. However, growing up in the Middle Ages, and more specifically in France, uh, they liked to have barbecues. Except it wasn't delicious mouth-watering ribs or chicken, it was cats. And it wasn't for eating, but just for entertainment. Yeah, just for a, a, a good old laugh. Uh, don't have time today, but I've got a great story about a stray cat. Maybe I'll, I'll use that for my first stand-up routine, we'll see. But regardless, I'm just trying to have fun in this one because it just makes me sad. Let's move on to the next one. Number eight, mob football. Football is the world sport. Name a country, they probably have a team in it. And Canada might even bring the cup home this year, boys and girls. Now that would be cool. However, uh, the billion dollar sport was nothing close to what it is today. Football has rules, regulations, and athletes performing at peak performance. Ronaldo was one heck of a player. In medieval times, there were no rules on how many players there could be. Sometimes it was even whole towns versus one another. The ball? <laughs> Not something you can find in the back of your favorite department store. It was an inflated pig bladder. Ugh. The only goal was to get it to the other side with any means necessary, which oftentimes meant it was going to get physical. A lot, a lot of beating and whatnot, a lot of hitting. Not very good, don't do that. I'll stick uh, not playing that sport, thanks. Number seven, torches. Moving straight from hygiene to whatever this is. Starting a fire is extremely hard. You'll see two guys rubbing sticks together in the movies and suddenly fire appears, but you know what? That doesn't work at all. The conditions for friction alone being enough to start a fire have to be absolutely perfect. The right temperature, the right humidity, the dryness, all of it. So this is why people decided to find other methods for starting fires, such as flint, a material that is fairly easy to find wherever you go. But with flint, you also need tinder, and this is where it gets a little weird. It always gets weird with tinder. The Vikings had a particular species of mushroom that they'd use for their torches, which they would carefully prepare and then boil in their own urine. Well, because, and it's honestly more likely that they found this out through trial and error, they probably didn't actually know the chemicals and all this, urine contains sodium nitrate, which burns real good, as it's a chemical neighbor of potassium nitrate, which is found in gunpowder. This was actually a fairly common technique for creating torches, at the time and you know just really cool if not like you know really weird number six the 81 yule offerings christmas is coming and if you're a viking that usually isn't a great thing not because of the norse gods or anything vikings were actually pretty quick to pick up christianity but more because christmas was the time where a pretty brutal ritual would take place Specifically referred to as Yule, the ritual was estimated to have been in honor of family members that had passed away, and generally involved singing, dancing, and killing 81 men to offer their heads to the gods. Merry Christmas! Number 5. How to Ward Off Draugr Draugr, for those who didn't play Skyrim, are a Viking denomination of the undead. It's presumed as a certainty that when a person is buried in the ground, they will rise from the dead as a Draugr. 
From there, they'll attack people, and everyone will generally have a bad time until the Draugr is killed via decapitation, dismemberment, or any act of making it just not move anymore. To prevent this from happening in the first place, Viking land burials were done extremely carefully. Straw would be placed under the body, and scissors would be laying on the chest, while their toes were sewn together and nails were pushed through their feet. They would then deconstruct a portion of the house and take the corpse out through it, reconstructing it later, as Draugr were believed to follow the path back from their place of burial. They would then be entombed, and all of the items they'd owned that remained in their house would be turned upside down until their grave was magically sealed. Number 4. Berserkers a denomination of shamans, berserkers were warriors trained to fight and channel various spirits into their body. There were three schools of berserker, the wolf, boar, and bear, each one serving a slightly different role. To train, these berserkers were sent out into the wilderness to become more in tune with nature, and also drive themselves insane in the process. This would supposedly imbue them with the strengths of their respective school of combat, and so when they were called upon to enter into Norse conflicts, they were supposedly given the ability to transform into their respective animal, ripping the opposing warriors to shreds. This account is shared both by Vikings and the victims of Vikings, though it is more than likely that this is just an exaggeration meant to imply the bestial behavior of a berserker when in a trance. Number 3. Pale Skin Ladies, beauty, and the industry. Look, there's a lot of things that can bring you up, bring it down. The makeup industry can be kind of tough to wrap your head around. It's, it's crazy, I know that. And there's been some crazy ideas out there throughout history. I think Medieval Times takes the cake though. You start with hair. Alright, so we're going for the George Costanza look. Balding or receding hairline. Beautiful. No eyebrows and no eyelashes? Oh, even better. If this look wasn't enough for you, now you gotta make your skin pale. Like really pale. And the only sure way to do that, ladies, is bloodletting, which I hate talking about every time it comes up. I hate it, dude. Time to bleed for beauty, ladies, and as if that's not already done already. You let some blood go and you feel a little lightheaded, but now you're finally ready for the ball. Look, the hair thing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't define anything. Wear it how you want. Please don't hurt me, Will Smith. But the blood thing? I just, I can't recommend that to anyone. Don't, don't lose your blood for, to, to go pale. I, oh, that's a horrible feeling. Number two, Dracula's grave. Vampires, they're real. Sadly though, they're not as gorgeous as the ones seen on the big screen and TV. Well, at least the people in medieval Europe thought they were real. So real that they used to take extra measures to make sure they could sleep soundly at night. Don't want your precious life juice sucked out of your neck. Unless it's for beauty, because that's normal. Do you have a family member who always checks to see if the oven is turned off before you leave the house? Well, this is kind of like that, except it was burials and driving wooden stakes to the hearts of cadavers. Just in case, you know? A little vampire insurance, if you will. We went from being afraid of those who fear garlic to wanting to date them. How the tables have turned. Number one, night, knighthood. As cool as it may seem in the movies or games, I personally wouldn't want to be a part of it. Knights were warriors of a noble class who started learning and training at a very young age. Squires and knighthood. A militaristic education ain't the worst thing ever, sure, but it's, it's the war and fighting itself that scares me. This is brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat we're talking about here. Swords and shields, bows and arrows, horseback warfare. Nothing can fully prepare you for that. Personally, the armor is not an issue. Not moving around in it, it's actually more flexible than you might think. Seriously, look, it is, it's more flexible. It's the idea of trying to take off the armor after returning from battle and running around and slaying the enemy all day. Uh, chafing in metal cannot be fun, just saying. Number 10, public latrines. Starting this list off, we're going back to the Romans. Do as they do, right? So picture a modern day locker room, just all sitting beside each other, but toilets. Yeah, gross, but social and everyone helped each other. Uh, yeah, whenever you're done with that little sponge thing there, Patroclus, throw her on down, buddy boy, thanks. Take your time. Yeah, in ancient Rome, public latrines, AKA public washrooms, didn't have toilet paper, or seats, or hand soap, or separators. Just sitting on a church pew, shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, worst part, you would just sit and share a stick with a sponge thing stuck on top of it. You would all share the sponge. It's tradition, right? They did this for like a thousand years. Said it built confidence and social skills. Dude, I can't even go to a urinal with someone sitting beside me because I'm shy, let alone sitting next to each other, showing each other's pictures from the cottage weekend, talking shop in front of 10 people. 
Hey, buddy, you mind just scooching over there? Yeah. It's gonna be a messy one. We ate a lot of figs earlier. Thanks. Number nine, feed the dead. Since we're on the topic of ancient Rome, let's dive in with a couple of libations. Yeah, we love libations around here. Throughout history, libations have been offered to the dead. Honor those who have passed, right? One of these. Pour one out for the homie, right? Where did this come from? Well, this is a tradition that we still see today, but it began, of course, in the ancient world. It began in Egypt and other parts of Africa, and of course, ancient Greece. Those are the main, main three right there. Pour one out for the lad, but in ancient Roman tradition, they would actually pour the wine into their resting place. How amazing is that? Just a nice snorkel for the dead. Romans crafted these lead or wood tubes during their lost comrade's burial. They would have it included. So afterwards, it's a one-way trip to the afterlife. You're not spilling anything on the ground. Nobody gets left behind in celebrations, even after death. I love it. I could see how one would think this is a little unnatural, but I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't getting any ideas right about now. Yeah, after I go, just dump a bunch of iron brew down the pipe. I'll be good. I'll be strong as in the next life. Number eight, boot and rally. Ah, the old boot and rally. Drinking beers from a stinky old used boot. The old shoey. Yeah, I've played some rugby over the years. I've drank a boot or two for a nasty try. And let me tell you, when your six, eight flanker has athlete's foot, probably the most disgusting tradition that we could probably shouldn't let live on. The boot and rally started from military origins. Soldiers would celebrate or initiate each other by drinking a full beer from a fellow comrade's, or even if you were lucky enough, the general's boot. Yeah, after, of course, it had been worn all day. Fighting battles. Can you imagine what you'd step on in and over during a battle, a war? That's pretty gross, dude. Just so hot and stinky and wet from the muck and mud, and it's your turn to enjoy a crispy Molson out of a size 13 wide with trench foot? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. No, I'm, I'm full. Not to be confused, of course, with puke and rally. That's, well, I guess, well, also hand in hand with each other, you know? They go together, like spaghetti and meatballs. The old puking from drinking out of a shoe and then drinking some more until you mm, puke more. Tradition. Skull! Number seven, public delifing. There were jails and dungeons in medieval times, sure, make no mistake of that. However, a lot of times sentencing for crimes would often lead you to losing your head, where a large sweaty man, such as myself, wearing a black cloth mask would take a very sharp axe, sword, or any other sharp utensil of war from the war cabinet and liberate your head from your shoulders. Thing is, some folks would come out to watch this, as this was apparently a form of entertainment. I mean, why not? I guess, sure. Sure, it's, fr it's friendly family fun. Bring the youngins, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. Pack some sandwiches just to make sure, just to make sure you stay out of the splash zone. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why they did that. That was pretty common. That's weird. Number six, Wario shoes. Fashion. I'm not a fashion guy, and I don't claim to be. I don't have the cash flow for it. But one day, I swear, if I got the do re mi, it'll be leisure suits and Frank Sinatra every time I sit down to eat a meal. Gotta have those shoes to match that Frank energy. Shoes that say, yes, I am moderately talented and handsome and have a great following, but I have some shady connections to the Italian mafia. <laughs> villain energy. Well, what's more villainous than a pair of Wario shoes? Yes, some medieval shoes were big and pointy and sometimes floppy. It was a sign of wealth, class, prestige, and the calling card of a portly Mario doppelganger. Surely you might not even wear these bad boys outside, but that's because you trip and fall, and I wouldn't want to trip and fall out there. I feel like any injury back then is uh, not good for your health. A cut could kill you, you know, you don't want that. Number five, animals on trial. All right, look, this one just doesn't make any sense. Zero sense. Law and Order. Besides being a great TV show, some would say it's the best thing we've ever come up with. Actual Law and Order, not, not the show. Thank goodness the system is perfect and never fails anyone ever. Well, they used to put animals on trial. <laughs> I'm gonna say that again. They used to put animals on trial. Not sure how that works though. When cross-examining the witness, at what point do you call this BS? When you realize there's a barnyard animal on trial for a crime, or when the witness response is moo or oink. Like what, you know? Like I don't know, it's, it's just silly. Unless people in the dark ages could actually talk to animals, and we since lost that ability as people, Nah, I'm just kidding, that's just weird. Just don't do that. Don't, don't put animals on trial, dude. Number four, consummation of the union. I know I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. This is a story just as old as time itself. You get married, Pope's happy, dad's happy with it, mom's happy, you got a blushing bride, what more do you need? That sounds great, right? Well, 
Well, uh, things would be great, but you have to sign off on the marriage. Cross your T's, dot your I's, so to speak. Train going into the tunnel, the bedroom dance, the hanky panky. What bad marriages only do on birthdays and Hanukkah? Yeah, you know. Well, if that isn't depressing enough, how about having the family come and watch like they just subbed to ye the OnlyFans? No, not just your family, but religious nobles, respectable people in your community. And they're going to watch you do the deed. They're there to make sure the marriage is complete. I just, do you, do you cheer on? I don't know, like, that's just so weird. Number three, plague flowers. <laughs> Speak of the devil. Historically, the symbolism of flowers has changed quite a bit. Flowers like to bob and weave, you know? It's like, someone die, oh, they got married. Okay, well, here's the same thing, enjoy. There's the flowers for the centerpieces, the bouquets for the bride and bridesmaids. There's flowers everywhere at a wedding, but why is that? Well, the idea of carrying a bouquet at a wedding dates back to ancient Greece, where it was believed that carrying a bouquet was thought to ward off evil spirits. Yeah, I hate when those interrupt weddings. It's always the worst. Like, any objections? A ghoul stands up, I'm like, oh, it's my ex. I knew it, I knew he'd show up. That's just Bagul, yeah, it's a college thing. Just sit down, he's fine. But a little later on down the line, the presence of bouquets at weddings got a little darker and dare I say, a little more precautionary. During the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, when the Black Death was running rampant throughout Europe, folks were trying anything and everything to try and ward off the plague. No more spirits, we're just kind of focused on, you know, the physical plague at hand. See, back then people believed that smells carried contagion, so we'd fight them off by using good smells. So people would fill their pockets with fragrant things to keep the plague at bay. Take like those plague doctors with the big bird nose, just stuffed with dandelions or whatever they can find. This was later integrated into wedding practices and brides started carrying down the aisle stinky stuff, like a bouquet of garlic or dill. I just have a nice dill pickle sticking out, you're like, yeah, it's, it's the big day all to protect them from catching a plague or two. Over the years, the stinky stuff was then replaced again with nice smelling flowers, thank God. But imagine if it stayed on garlic. What a dream, I love garlic and or dill. Sorry to all my vampire friends, but I'm going old school for my big day, personally. Just onions and garlic, I'm like, ah, oh, it smells so good, it's so good always. Number two, hazing. First off, I don't condone it. Second off, I've never done it or been a part of it. Not really a frat guy myself. But I did have friends dare me to do stupid growing up. I can't lie. North America is full of colleges and universities who take part in this tradition as they take it very seriously. If you can even call it a tradition. The hazing rituals that commence in fraternities and sororities can be deadly, literally. There's a million scary stories that are true surrounding these challenging initiation processes. And I'd say the majority of them are sadistic and dangerous. If you have to do something that risks your life to prove that you're down, nah man, that's not for me. I got essays to write. Hazing has a history dating as far back to 387 BC with the founding of Plato's Academy. At the time, hazing was called penalism, which meant, quote, a system of mild oppression and torment practiced upon first year students. Torment is the right word here. Even Plato criticized the practice of hazing. He's like, no, that is too much. -eth. Like I understand camaraderie and brotherhood and all, but like chugging ketchup until you're on life support, like the school debt's enough, you know? And finally, number one, the monkey buffet. Okay, this last one here is a little unusual, but I want involved, I have a little FOMO already, just looking at this. Look at these little guys, come on, they're having so much fun. As its name subtly suggests, the monkey buffet festival in Bangkok has everybody at the table. Everybody eats. Smack dab, right in the middle of the ruins of the Frag Pram Sam Yacht Temple in Laburi, Thailand, a beautiful tall banquet awaits. It's a 13th century temple just covered in fresh fruit. It looks so inviting, I'm like, I'm hungry right now and I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh boy. Thing is, I said everybody eats. That's, that's not entirely true. This feast is held in celebration of Laburi's thousands of macaques, thought to bring good luck to the area and its people. Only the macaques eat at this festival. And yes, it can get a little messy, obviously. They like throwing food around, I've heard. They like throwing their it as well. So maybe just kind of heads up, I don't know. So if you're attending, bring your own snack or else there's pre-chewed watermelon waiting for you. That's also yummy too, if you don't mind. The macaque hair, just avoid that. We'll pull it out. Number 10, weddings. When we look back on history, the traditions of marriages generally stand out as unique ways to peer into the lives of ancient civilizations. With the Vikings, marriages were generally done as ways to join houses through blood ties, which were rarely romantic. Traditionally held on Friday, the day of Freya, goddess of fertility, the couple was separated to go through separate rituals. The bride would take a bath and 
also remove the Kronsen, which symbolized her status as a woman who was unwed and store it for her future daughter. The groom would then go and break into his ancestors' tomb and steal their stuff, uh, usually their swords. During the ceremony, rings and family swords would be exchanged, and a feast would be had in their honor. During this, one tradition was to stab their swords into a pillar. The deeper the sword went, the better their marriage would be and the more children they'd have. Number 9. Teeth Painting when exhuming the many skeletons of Vikings that have passed throughout history, a remarkable detail was found throughout all of them. Notches of varying size, depth, and length were found to have been cut into the teeth of these ancient warriors. The reason for their existence was something of a mystery. Furthermore, comparing the style to historical Vikings, the name of the Danish king Harold Bluetooth suggests that his title may have been slightly more literal than initially thought. This would have been achieved through the application of a mixture of resins and dyes, though whether or not it was permanent would be hard to know for sure, since the evidence has long since rotted away. Number 8. Blonde Hair The image of the Viking as a blonde-haired, blue-eyed warrior is prolific and also wrong. While the majority of Vikings were observed to be blonde and described as such, this was actually due to an extremely early application of hair dye. That being said, this wasn't solely due to fashion, though blonde hair was considerably valued in Viking society. The method in which Vikings dyed their hair was through the use of light lye, which contains potassium. Potassium can often strip the pigmentation off of hair, and if Vikings washed frequently, which they actually did, they were weirdly hygienic, then it would lead to their hair gradually being dyed blonde. A side effect of this was that lye was also extremely toxic to lice, which helped prevent outbreaks on ships. Number 7. Crummy Wine Nice, I love drinking wine and then immediately having to chew. That's lovely, let's talk about that. My favorite part of a wedding has to be the speeches, or the toasts, right, whatever. I love watching somebody improv their way through an important wedding speech. The train wreck, always. They're always way too long, way too personal, or just sad. Throw a joke in, I don't know, maybe a pun, wouldn't hurt. But where did this all begin, right? Back in the 1800s, only men were allowed to give these toasts, which is hilarious. It was always the oldest friend, the groom, best man, father of the bride, you name it. The whole thing would have been done in eight minutes, I imagine, because guys suck at speeches. At least from what I've seen, a lot of ums, a lot of ums. Wedding toasts go back as far as the 6th century BC. When Greeks were getting married, the father of the bride would drink the first glass of wine to make sure there was no poison in it. What an OG. Romans would drop a piece of burnt toast into the wine in order to make the wine taste less bitter as well. Yeah, hence the term toast. Yeah, wine was so bad back in the day, they had to use burnt toast, crystal light, just to make it better. Okay, cheers. That's it. Number six, handshakes. We all do it. Meeting the in-laws folks about to smash a job interview. Usually starts with this. Hey, how are you? Nice to meet you. But after living through this pandemic, why do we still do this? Well, the handshake has existed in some form or another for thousands of years. One popular theory is that the gesture began as a way of conveying your intentions of peace. Lots of loyalty issues back then. Empty hand means no weapons. Some suggest that the up and down motion of the handshake was supposed to dislodge any knives or loose hidden up the sleeve threats. The other explanation is that the handshake was a symbol of trust and that I give you my germs, you give me your germs. We both trust each other, hands meet in hands. Now, add a little bit of spit or some blood into the mix and we got ourselves a real bond there, brother. The bacteria from one person to another person would be shared and mutual. Disgusting. In ancient Rome, the handshake was even used as a symbol of friendship and love. Oh, that's nice. A pair of clasped hands even appear on the ancient Roman coins, signifying peace. That's a good one. I like this. This it turned from gross to nice all of a sudden. Number five, wet willies. And immediately back into the gross. Here we go. I'm already angry thinking about a wet willy. I've gotten a few in my life and I'm still mad at all three of them. Whoever thought of this, like, yeah, I'm just gonna suck my finger and then put it in someone's head, put it right in their ear canal. Freaks, disgusting. Keep your coffee breath away from my good ideas. This weird tradition slash prank slash gross hobby all began back in 1864 in, of course, England. You guessed it, that's the origin of the term. And it all started when a wet, salivated finger went in the ear of an English fisherman named, you guessed it again, Willie. What if I said Brian? You'd be like, what the f Wet William, we could do that. 
a wet, wet Walter. Ooh, that's a bit too serious. Everybody laughed at this point, okay? This changed the game. It was like the moonwalk. Everyone was like, what did he just do? What happened? How did he do that? Growing up with ear problems, don't do wet willies. Wet willies are a bad idea. Digging up wax with your pinky even can create problems. If a vacuum forms between your ear and the eardrum, and then all of a sudden you, the sudden depressurization can damage your eardrums. And also, uh, it's fucking disgusting. So don't do those anymore. Number four, blowing out candles. I just did this a couple weeks ago. So the people who ate that cake, yeah, sorry for all my germs. But it's my party and I'll cry if I want to. That should be a song. The age old tradition of aggressively exhaling your bodily fluid and air before arguing over who gets the biggest piece. I love it. Traditions, right? However, thanks to modern medicine now, we know blowing out candles can expel virus particles, just like breathing, shouting, coughing, and sneezing. And if the person's infected, that makes it a really gross. So a nice big gust of your lungs ought to do it. People believe that the smoke from the candles carry their wishes and prayers off to the gods. Good omens kind of deal. It's also thought that the smoke would ward off evil spirits and bring positive energy for the coming year. Either or, it's fucking gross and we all still do it. Next time you're about to make a wish on your special day, just remember you're spitting on a cake. Am I wrong here? Birthday to you. Number three. The Blood Eagle. This one is not for the faint of heart. A ritualistic form of execution, the Blood Eagle is an extremely violent method of dispatching enemies which is described in the sagas. For a long period of time, these were thought to have been fictional, but as recent bodies have been unearthed that appear to have been victims of the Blood Eagle, there seems to be more truth to this than initially thought. The Blood Eagle involves the victim being laid on their front and a knife being used to separate their ribs from their spine. The spine is then removed and their lungs are spread out in the form of crimson wings, creating the eponymous Blood Eagle. Number two, the bloat. The bloat was set as a ritual that would occur once every season at four set intervals in a year but another could be organized if circumstances required it. The most well-recorded bloat was one performed by Sigurd Hakonson. Detailed by Snorri Sturluson in the saga of Hakon the Good, this ritual involved a massive amount of human and animal sacrifices, as well as sacrifices of weaponry. Blood was also collected and splattered on the walls, altars, and participants. A feast would then be had, and toasts would be made, first to the gods, and then to the fallen. Number 1. Viking Chief Cremation Ceremonies We've all heard of Viking cremations, how they load their dead bro onto the ship and sail it out into the ocean, sending a flaming arrow into it so that they might be buried at sea. However, if it was a chief that died, things would get a little bit more screwed up and nasty. First off, one of the chief's girls would then volunteer or be volunteered to join the chief in the afterlife. She would then be made to get mad drunk and then would be made to sleep with every single man in the village. Seriously, she would then be strangled, stabbed, and loaded onto the boat and the whole fire thing would go down. What can I say except what? <laughs> 